22, beginning with verse 15 for our reading this morning. And we'll be observing communion at the end of the service, instead of right after the last uh, song before the sermon. So I begin reading it. And Jesus said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine in, uh, until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. Jesus celebrated the Passover with the disciples the night before he went to the cross. The Passover has been celebrated since the exodus of the Jews from Egypt. That night, when they were to leave Egypt, God said, I'm going to pass through the land. I'm going to send the angel through the land. And the firstborn of every family will be killed, except those in which you spread the blood or sprinkle the blood of the lamb that you have killed. You will eat the Passover lamb, and you will sprinkle your doorposts, and the angel of death will pass over you. Following that, of course, they went out and across into the desert land and the wilderness and then ultimately up into the promised land. But for years, the Jewish people have celebrated the Passover. And Jesus was celebrating it that night, but he said at the end of it, at the close of it, I'm giving you a new testament, a new covenant in my blood. And he said, as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you will show the Lord's death till he come. And since that time, for the last 2,000 years, the Church of Christ, and we are doing it again today, has celebrated the Lord's Supper rather than the Passover. And this we will continue to celebrate until we're taken home to be with the Lord. And he said, I'll not eat this bread or drink this cup with you and celebrate this until I celebrate it with you in the kingdom. We will not celebrate it in heaven. But not until we come back in the kingdom will we celebrate this with him. The symbols are these, the bread and the cup. The bread represents the body of Christ which was broken for us upon Calvary. When there he took our sins upon him, there he paid the price of our sins, and there God judged him and judged our sins upon him. The cup speaks of his blood that he shed there for the remission of our sins to wash them and wash us whiter than snow. And since that time we can sing, what a friend we have in Jesus. And all of the Old Testament blood sacrifices pointed to the cross. And the day that Jesus died. Have you ever wondered why? When Jesus was here, it seemed so plain that people should know that he was the Messiah. Why? Why didn't those scribes and Pharisees who told the wise men that the king, the Messiah, would be born in Bethlehem? And why didn't they knew? Why didn't they go see? Why didn't they investigate Jesus, the one who was preaching, teaching, as no man ever had taught before, and he who could heal the sick and raise the blind and feed the multitude, and raise the dead. Why didn't they believe? Why did they said they said, well, no prophet is going to come out of Galilee. Couldn't they have investigated and gone back to that night and said, yes, he was born in Bethlehem. Why? When so many people were being healed, and so many people were being helped, and so many people were being fed, and they wanted to come and take him king, and make him king right then. And he presented himself as king as he rode in on that Palm Sunday. But the attitude of the people had changed from Hosanna to crucify him. Why? Because in the plan of God, the Lamb of God was to come into the world to pay the price of our sins that we could not pay for to give us something that we do not deserve. And it's ours by simple faith in him. Communion celebrates salvation. Thank God for the salvation that's yours and mine. 
And communion is a message of salvation, a message of the gospel. And we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that the gospel that Paul gave was how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And the gospel offers salvation to us. I realize that some of the liberals say, well, the gospel is feeding the multitudes. The gospel is, is uh, giving housing to the to the unhoused and feeding the hungry and so forth. But no, the gospel is simply this, how that Christ died for our sins. And the gospel in a nutshell is found in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, salvation does not, or salvation is not brought by. In other words, we cannot be saved by keeping communion, by observing communion. In my last church, there was a little lady that she came out of it, a different persuasion. And she came to the Lord, but she never really got rid of all the old grave, grave clothes. And she would not miss a communion Sunday as long as she had the help to be there. And there was a reason for it. Because when she could no longer be there and was a shut-in, she, she almost demanded that myself or one of the deacons would bring communion around to her every week because she was raised in this type of feeling that this added grace and salvation to you. And that unless you were baptized and unless you took communion, you couldn't make it to heaven. And I couldn't get it through her head. That no, communion is a memorial service remembering what Jesus has done for us. There's no special merit in partaking of communion except this. It celebrates our salvation. It reminds us that Jesus Christ is our savior and that we are the sheep of his pasture. And like John the Baptist said, he must increase, but I must decrease. And remember that we have not saved ourselves, but it's only by God's grace that any one of us are ever going to be in heaven. Now we can know that right now. We can know right now that if we died this instant and we stood before God, that he'd say, come on into my heaven. Because the Bible says in the Gospel of John, these things are written that you might know that you have eternal life. And if you don't know it, don't leave this church house without knowing that your sins have been forgiven. But it reminds us of our spiritual roots. It reminds us of who God is and what he has done for us and who we are. And it reminds us to clean up our act. Now, it also celebrates forgiveness. Think about the people who were there. There was Peter at that table. Have you ever, ever wondered why when you see a picture of the 12 at the Last Supper, they're all on one side? The photographer said, now, all of those who want to get in the picture, please get on the other side of the table. But Peter was there. Now, Peter had just said, just a few hours before this, he said, when Jesus said, all of you are going to forsake me and deny me, Peter said, not me, Lord. How about that, Ernie Miller? I pawned the pulpit once, and those of you who remember Ernie Miller as preacher, he used to pawn the pulpit. And he'd holler some too, but a lot, in fact. But Peter said, I won't deny you, though everybody else denies you. I won't. I'll even die for you. Well, what happened? You remember? There he stood around the fire, the devil's fire. Jesus was up there being tried. Somebody came to him, a little girl came to him. You're one of them, aren't you? No. Somebody else came to him pretty soon again. You're one of them for sure. No, I, I'm not. I don't know him. Finally, one of the men came and said, you've got to be one of him. Your speech betrays you. You're out of Galilee. And he began to swear and to curse. He said, I don't know the man. Just then, because Jesus had said, Peter, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. Just then, he looked up and Jesus was looking at him. And he went out and wept bitterly. Could the Lord ever forgive him? He probably said. Can Jesus ever forgive him? He said, there was Thomas there. And you remember just three days later, that night of the resurrection, Thomas was the only one of the disciples. Judas, of course, had already gone to hell. But, but uh, Thomas wasn't there. And when the disciples said, the Lord, is, the Lord is alive, the Lord is risen, Thomas said, unless I see the print of the nails in his hand and the wound in his side, and thrust my finger into the holes of the hand and my hand into his side. I won't believe. 
The next Sunday night, guess what? Thomas was there, and Jesus appeared. My Lord and my God, he said. Now, God forgave them. All of the disciples forsook the Lord and fled. But he forgave them all. Now, he can forgive us, too. And that's what I want to get down to. The Bible says in John 1.9, 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All we have to do is just confess, Lord, I've blown my top. The man stayed afterwards to talk to me, and he said, I'm having an awful time with my temper. And he was talking about how he lost it this morning with his wife. And uh, we, we talked about it, how the, the Lord wants us to commit ourselves to him and without without breaking our spirit. In other words, we're glad. Some of you can just take a hold of the, uh, of the situation and get the job done. You're, you're that type of person. And some of us, you know, we're just a little bit slower about things. Well, without breaking our spirit, God wants to break our will. It's that way whether you're training dogs, horses, or husbands. And uh, we, have to, we have to remember that God wants us to be. She got me well trained. Uh, God wants us to follow him, not to try to lead the parade, but to follow him. But again, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, before we partake of communion, we ought to examine ourselves. And this is the first Sunday of the year. This is the first day of the year. And maybe you haven't made New Year's resolutions, but you ought to. You really ought to. Seriously, seriously, don't drag your old sins and failures into the new year. Don't do those things that grieve the Holy Spirit. Make a resolution and keep it that you will read your Bible through and that you will pray every day and that you will seek to live a God-honoring life. We need to begin the year and we have that opportunity now, right? on January 1st to begin with a clean slate. Every year, the funeral home, Langlands, gives me a new record book or daily calendar type of book. And it's got pages for 365 days and, and I put things ahead that are coming and I jot down how many calls I've made and, and uh, different things, how many are in the services and all of this. And I've kept them for almost 50 years and I have them in one of the drawers upstairs in my office uh, of these books. But last night, I finished off the book for 211 and I put it away. I put it away until income tax time because I keep track of my mileage, how many miles I drive in my work, you know. But I put it away and I got out that new slate and I thought, Lord, help me do better this year. You know, and we ought to make that type of resolution. But communion celebrates the future too. He said, do this until I come again. And not only the bread, not only the cup, but also the coming of Christ is a mark of taking communion. We look forward to his return. The next thing on God's calendar is the rapture. How the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and that's coming. And it could happen today. Mary has given to the Sunday school class a little magnet to put on your refrigerator that says perhaps today. Perhaps today. And Jesus Christ could call us home today. But if death occurs first, no big deal if you know Jesus. Absent from the body is present with the Lord Jesus. Amen. The body goes to the ground, but Friday I had a funeral. And I think the Lord thought I needed it. Not my own, of course, but uh, he thought I needed it because we were coming home from someplace Friday. And, and I said to Mary, I think I'll, we're coming from a hospital call, I think. But at any rate, I said, I think I'll stop in Langlands and tell them they've forgotten me. I need one more funeral this, this year. Well, I've got one for Monday, but need one more for, for 211. We got home and not too long after that, Langman called and I had another service. The sad thing is the woman was 94. Her daughter was probably about 70 
And you could tell it was bad blood there between the, between the two of them. The mama wasn't saying a word, but the daughter was. But, uh, you know, we ought to get rid of things like that. We ought to just put them away. And we look forward to the time when he's going to come back. And in his kingdom, yes, as it says twice in this, in this passage, we're going to once again partake of communion with him. But now in celebration that it's over, we're in heaven. We're in heaven at last. And it says in that passage that I quoted from 1 Thessalonians, 4th chapter and verse 17, so shall, we, so shall we ever be with the Lord. And folks, the best is yet to come. I can't wait to see what this year has for us. Now, I'm getting weaker all the time, but I hope I'm getting stronger in spirit. Uh, sometimes I have to have Mary help me out of bed. And I get up in the morning and I, I think, who is that old man that's standing between me and the mirror? But thank God I can still keep going. And by, by the time night's here, I'm about 60 years old. And it just paired off 40 years. But one of these days, folks, we're going home and the best is yet to come. Death ain't no big deal, as Jake Hess used to sing. And the Bible says, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. And death is simply putting off the old body, which is getting older. And you know all the wrinkles. Don't you wish that there was some kind of an iron? Uh, you folks that are older, you kids that are under 65, you know what I'm talking about now. But to get rid of all the wrinkles, and someday it's going to happen. And we're going to have a glorified body. We're going to go to be with the Lord. And the best is, I can't get over it. I just get happy sometimes when I think about all the won't be's that are in heaven. There won't be wheelchairs. There won't be accidents. There won't be pain. There won't be arguments. There won't be just a lot of things. You know, there won't be, be no home theater. Hey, we'll be with the Lord. No wrinkles. No wrinkles. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. It's even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. But the three words of communion are the bread, the blood, and the blessed hope. And this is our chance, the first of the year, to just square accounts with God. And the blood of Jesus Christ can erase and help us to have that new start 